Let's get started. Galatians chapter 4, please. And then we left off at verse 17. Galatians chapter 4, verse 17. So remember, there were these Judaizers, which is surprisingly not much different from today, where people are trying to enforce people to follow Jewish values, actually. So these Judaizers, what are they doing? Look at verse 17. They zealously affect you. So these people are very zealous in trying to affect these people, but not well. But it's not for a good cause. So there's a lot of religions out there who zealously affect people and have a zeal. Now, whether you believe it or not, charismatics, they really do love Jesus. And when they do their praise and worship, it seems a lot better than a lot of other Christians who are Bible believers. Now, that's a sad fact. Why is that? Because they have more of an emotional heart toward Jesus Christ. So even though they're playing the devil's music, a lot of them, they're very sincere into it. But see, that zeal is not well. It's not a good zeal. That's the same thing with Mormons and Jehovah Witnesses. They put Christians to shame in going door to door, trying to tell people how to get saved. They are very zealous. But here's the thing is that it's not good. It's not well. Let's keep reading. Yea, so yes, they would exclude you. So these people, they want to zealously affect these Christians, but they want to exclude them from Paul. That ye might affect them. Why? So that those people can affect the sheep stealers. So Galatians chapter 4 verse 17 is a great example. Now I want you onliners to please pay attention to this. There's a group of heretics out there, and they will even profess themselves to be King James only, independent, fundamental Baptist. But they're going to teach you heresy, such as, for example, the church will go through the tribulation. For example, the church replaces the nation of Israel. And because of that, their preaching and teaching style, it seems to be very zealous, and you're like, man, they're affecting me. And so what they want to do is, in, as a matter of fact, they want to steal you yep. from church and, go, and tr travel down to a different state, which probably a third or a half of their churches consist of that, of sheep stealers, stealing people away to right. enter inside their church. Right. And these people who don't even age to middle-aged people, and they grow a beard so that they can deliberately look like older people, at least I'm not a hypocrite by doing so, so these people, they would deliberately do that so that, oh, look at me, I'm like a professional pastor, I'm like an older pastor, so that they can steal sheep, steal people. They'll deliberately attract attention. They, these guys are so zealous than a lot of other Christians that they're willing to get zapped at the border. They're willing to get electrocuted. But they're not going to do it again the second time because they learned their lesson, see? But the thing is, is that you got to watch out for these people. They're very zealous people so that they can exclude you. They can exclude you from a good godly Christian church. So these guys are zealous, but what they want to do is they want to steal. They want to steal you from Bible-believing truth, Bible-believing church. And Paul says they're excluding you. And yeah, you're zealous, Perhaps your soul winning improved immensely. Just like Mormons and Jehovah Witnesses, their soul winning greatly is improved compared to your cold, rundown Christian churches. Why? Because these Mormon Jehovah Witnesses have a zealous effect. So even though you go to a church that's King James only and then IFB, but they're teaching you heresy, and yeah, they may have zealously affected you to improve your soul winning, that doesn't make them good. That doesn't make them good. So they want to steal you. They want to steal you and take you to a path that's not well, that's not good. So here's the thing. I don't care. This, this is why it's so important. Some people think, Pastor, why do you get on these preachers who love Jesus? Why is it that you think that everyone's wrong and you're the only one that's right? 
and oh, who do you think you are? Aren't you mean? And these people, they won hundreds of souls to Jesus Christ. These people, they talk about, they preach against sin, and they talk about this kind of stuff. Here's the thing, friend, is that if they teach heresy or wrong doctrine, they are still in the wrong, no matter how zealous they are. Amen. The matter is doctrine, not sincerity. Because you can be a very sincere person, so dedicated that you can even just uh, be willing to die in the name of Allah. See? Just because you're zealous doesn't mean you're right. So you got to have right doctrine. Okay, let's keep reading right here. The last part of verse 17, I mentioned that, but let me repeat so you can understand. That ye might affect them. So that's the idea. They want to steal you. Why? So that you can affect them. See, that's why they want to steal people, because it does affect them. It encourages them. You know what they want? They want people who are independent, fundamental Baptist Christians so that they're easier to work with in their church. That's why they deliberately target independent, fundamental Baptist preachers, badmouth them so that they can steal their members. Those kind of people are incredible losers. Amen. Me, I don't do that. I just <laughs> preach the truth, and I could care less if you can come back. If you stay here or you come back, I could care less. I just preach the truth. What I consist in my church is people who want to serve God and do what's right. Amen, if you're from the other side of the country or out of state, I just give you a church nearby that you can go to that's Bible-believing. If it's not Bible-believing, then the best one I can offer you is Independent Fundamental Baptist. I don't need you to uh, drive out of the country, out of state to come to mine. If you do come to our church out of state, out of country, we welcome you with open arms. But I'm not that desperate. I'll do fine. Amen. I've been doing fine all this time. I think I'll be fine now. Let's look at verse 18. But it is good to be zealously affected always in a good thing. So Paul's saying it is good to be affected when it is in a good thing, when it's the right kind of thing. It's good to be zealously affected. This is so important. And I wish my church will understand this too. And not only when I am present with you. Is that okay? Good. I'm glad you understood that part. This is so important to understand. Bible believing churches should consist of zeal. And the zeal that we have is in the right things. Look, if we have right doctrine, right standards, then when we have zeal, it's a good thing. But Paul says it's also when I am not present with you. What does that mean? When the pastor is not here. You know what's very sad in majority of churches, and I'll dare say probably Bible-believing churches, is that unless the pastor is there, then that's when they get zealous. They'll be faithful in soul winning, faithful in attendance, faithful in fellowship, faithful in the kind of preaching, teaching, or the atmosphere that gives a shouting atmosphere, or whatever. But the thing is this, is that, look, I want your zeal to continue even without the pastor. Amen. That's how it should be. You don't need the pastor. Sometimes I notice if I do something, then it kind of revs up. It changes the whole atmosphere. So that should not be the case. I'm glad that I have that effect on you. It shows how much you depend upon me. But too much dependence shows that you lack independence yourself. Amen. You got to realize that it's got to be your decision, your heart, not whenever pastor does things. I mean, you left the, the Catholic Church. Many of you left the Catholic Church or some kind of slavery system so that, why? So that you can study the Bible for yourself, so that you don't follow some kind of pastor or pope. That's important. We believe in submission. We don't believe in rebel rousers. But for crying out loud, we don't believe in dependent robots in this church. All right? One day I might just uh, die down on you in the middle of singing just to pull a dirty trick on all of you and then see how it goes after that. And trust me, sometimes I notice that, all right? So see, here's the thing. Just don't let that affect you. Don't let pastor affect you. One day pastor might have a bad day. If he has a bad day, that should not affect you and ha make you have a bad day because pastor's imperfect. What's going to happen? Okay, so let's keep reading right here. Verse 19, my little children. So these people, these Christians in the Galatian churches, Paul calls them his little children, of whom I travail in birth again. So Paul's saying, I'm giving birth to you again 
until Christ be formed in you. So Paul's complaining that I'm giving birth to you again until Christ be more grown in you. Now, what does that mean right here? What that means is this, is that see, these people, they are affected by their pastor here. So the pastor here is groaning that, oh man, I have to be there for you again. I have to be there for you again and as if I'm giving you birth again. So let me write that one. Giving birth again. Do you know how hard that is for a pastor? The, one of the worst things that a pastor would ever do is after years of working, and then he has to start all over again. Did that happen to you, pastor? Oh, yeah, that happened to me. I hate that. But the thing is this, is that Paul's whining over here that he has to do that again. Why? Because they went back to a baby stage again. They lost their growth, their maturity. And so the pastor's whining that he has to give them birth again. And he calls them his children. You might say, so that's interesting. Correct. So you got to understand this. The pastor, he is considered to be your father. So let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. The funny and the weird thing is, I guess God has a sense of humor, is that he'll take some kind of 21-year-old little Korean and then he would make him a father of a bunch of uh, people in the church. If that ain't weird, I don't know what that is. <laughs> if that ain't weird, I don't know what that is. But that's God's way of doing things. He has a way of making it humorous sometimes. But here's the thing is that you are considered to be my children. Now you might say, how so? The reason why is because I'm spiritually feeding you. I'm spiritually growing you, nursing you. So you understand that with the soul that you lead to Jesus Christ and you help them grow, you're considered to be their parent. So let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 4, and then we'll read verse 15. For though ye have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have ye not many what? Look at that. So God wants you to be a father. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. Notice right here, he begotten them, gave birth to them through the gospel. That's why he became their father. Now you got to realize this, friend, is that you, in our churches, we've got to have more fathers. I shouldn't be the only father. We've got to have a whole bunch of fathers in here. People who are spiritually growing other people. That's how it's got to be. Let's look back in our main text. Let's go back to Galatians 4. So when you look at the priest, and then he says, no, you call me father, then I should t I'm going to tell him, no, you got to call me father. <laughs> I'm actually the father to him. You know why? Because he is taking a religious title for himself that he himself is being a hypocrite for doing. You got to understand that the f spiritual father is an application to people who actually lead people to Jesus Christ, actually spiritually feed them. It's not applied to Roman Catholic priests who didn't save a dead cat from hell anyways, no matter how many times you confess your sins to him. So he is actually not considered to be the spiritual father. Okay, let's look back over here. We're going to look back at verse 19. So Paul's whining he has to give birth to, to them again until what? Christ be formed in you. Now this is very important to understand is that when the pastor is, I think the best word is maturing you, so like he's feeding, growing, nursing you. During this process, you got to realize that Christ is in you. But Christ, he's not matured in you. Now what does that mean? What that means is this, is it's talking about your spiritual nature. When you get saved in Jesus Christ, your spiritual nature is a babe, right? When you get saved, you're a baby. But you haven't been feeding it. You haven't been growing it. You haven't been uh, nurturing it. So right now, the Lord Jesus Christ, yes, he is inside you. The Holy Spirit is inside you, but he's not grown. You got to realize that even though Christ and the Holy Spirit is in you, that doesn't mean they've grown in you. How do they grow in you? When you give up more of your flesh to them. See, that's why the flesh should shrink, be crucified, die more, whereas the spiritual nature it should grow more. It should overcome it more. By doing that, then Christ can take much more of your life. Sometimes you wonder, why is it that Jesus Christ, his manifestation is not shown out of me? Very simple. He's not grown. You can tell the difference with preachers. You can tell by just by their atmosphere alone how much they've grown in Jesus Christ 
or if Jesus Christ is really in that preacher. Preachers think that the more that they shout, they can manifest God's power. No, that's flesh. That's flesh. It doesn't matter if you shout or if you're quiet. People can tell. And how can people tell? It's when he's grown in you. Not by the number of people you have in your church. Not by how spectacular your sermon is. It's Christ, how he's moving in your walk. And people can tell. So Christ... He can be formed in you. He can grow more within you. So I wonder if you truly have that in your life. There are some people who believe in some kind of second grace. And some people think that by the signs and healing, I can manifest Jesus Christ or the Holy Spirit. By speaking in tongues, I can manifest God's power and the Holy Spirit. That is very fleshy, those charismatics. Charismatics, they'll say, oh, you're blaspheming the Holy Ghost. You're being so insensitive, and they get overtly emotional and even angry. At that point, I know that they're fleshy. That's not of Jesus Christ. Amen. You know what's of Jesus Christ? If you think the manifestation of God's power is only by, by you have to have a healing, you have to have a speaking of tongues, then you are very shallow yeah. with the power of Jesus Christ. You know what? The power of Jesus Christ can be manifested in an 80-year-old woman who's stuck in a nursing home and she can't even soul win, she can't even see anymore, but you can see Christ Almighty manifesting in her life, stuck in a bed, and she don't have to do anything. Amen. You might say, how so? Oh, people can tell. The more that you draw closer to Jesus Christ, the Bible says, out of the abundance of uh, the heart, the mouth speaketh. See that? So the more you have in your heart, it's going to show outwardly. People will know. People will know you're the real deal. All right, let's keep reading. Verse 20. I desire to be present with you now. So Paul, he has a strong desire to be with them. He wants to be present with them. And to change my voice. So Paul's thinking that I have to change my style, the way that I talk to them. Why? For I stand in doubt of you. So Paul... He's standing in doubt of them. So which is really sad. So we see right here these are people who are easily stolen by some kind of zealots out there. Now, this speaks a lot. I can understand this as a pastor. What's going on is that when these guys are being zealously affected by these sheep stealers, Paul is like, man, I got to get them back. So... Paul's like, man, I, the only way I can win them back is I have to be present with them, which is true. I notice that if I don't keep up with calling them, for example, or following up with them, they get, they get drawn away and they don't come back. I also notice, so Paul said, I wish to be present with you, right? Are you looking at that verse? This is so much like the ministry. Another thing he says that I wish that I could change my voice. That's so true. Pastor's going to have to tone down a bit. Pastor's going to have to understand what they're going through so that he can meet them better. And do you know how frustrating that is? That's giving what? Birth again. That's giving birth again. That's a very frustrating thing. But this is so true ever since, look, nothing changed ever since the first centuries of Christianity. People are still the same in churches. Galatians is very true with uh, unfortunately, Christians who have not matured today. Verse 20, the last part says, why is he doing this? Why he has to feel like being present, change his voice? Because he don't, this is so true, trust them. He don't trust them enough. That's very true. Sometimes pastor can't trust you enough the way that he can freely do things, freely speak, or freely think things. So then he realizes, yeah, I can't really trust what they're going to think of me. They might misunderstand me for this. They might take it the wrong way. So I'm going to have to change my voice, be present with them, as if I'm giving birth to them all over again. That's a, very, that's a frustrating thing about the ministry, and that's a sad thing. That should not be the case with you. All right, let's look at verse 21. Tell me, so Paul's saying, tell me. Ye that desire to be under the law. Those people want to be under the law. Remember, that's what they're stealing them on. These guys are people trying to get them back into the Old Testament law. So he's saying, tell me if you want to go back to the Old Testament law. Do ye not hear the law? So Paul's saying, don't you, don't you even hear the law? 
Don't you even know what the law says? Don't you hear what it's saying? And we already looked at the previous verses at chapter 3, right? Paul says, look, if, you're, if you claim to be a law-abiding person, you got to realize this. If you break one thing out of the law, you break the whole thing. I also brought up very good arguments that how you can witness effectively to a Jew or to a Seventh-day Adventist or to black Hebrew Israelites or to the Hebrew Roots Movement or anybody who's trying to bring you to Old Testament practices. The best way to affect them is, hey, if you keep stressing about the law, don't you even know what the law says? And then bring up all these Old Testament principles that they themselves didn't even do. Ask, ask the guys and the girls out there, did you circumcise yourself? <laughs> See, they didn't even do that. At least in Galatians, these Judaizers force them to be circumcised. <laughs> At least they can do that. So bring up these facts to them. That way they can see that, you know what? If I'm truly a law-abiding person, I gotta, can't just pick and choose which laws I want to follow. I've got to follow the whole law. Otherwise, I'm a hypocrite. Okay, so Paul's bringing up that argument again at verse 21.